Hey, Bowtie Nation. Thanks for joining me. Joseph Hogue here. Um, thanks for joining me for another one of these Beer Money Sundays. You know, I've got mine. Hope you got yours, whether it's an adult beverage or otherwise. Been talking to uh, everybody out there in the uh, in the chat for the last 20 minutes or so. We like to get started a little bit early sometimes uh, just to give everybody a chance to, uh, to get those notifications. But thanks for being here again. Wanted to take the opportunity to, uh, as you know, kind of a slow news week, wasn't a lot happening in the markets with the holiday shortened markets. So I wanted to take the opportunity to just, you know, let you know a little bit about myself. I love doing these face-to-face uh, you know, live streams, getting to know all you out there. But uh, I realized, you know, I've never really shared much about myself, right? And, you know, I'm always, always a little shy about that. Uh, but, uh, but I thought it'd be fun, you know, get to know me uh, into 2022. I'd really like to do a lot more local meetings, you know, when we eventually do move back to the States, they're move, moving to Tampa. So doing some local meetings there in uh, Florida, as well as nationally. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to let you know about me and some some of the weird stuff that maybe you don't know quite, a, quite uh, as much about. Uh, before we do get started, I do want to uh, let's uh, open up the other uh, thing here. Oh. I do want to invite you to uh, to get the uh, the bow tie daily or the bow tie weekly. Excuse me. That is our uh, weekly weekly newsletter. Really just something I like to do for all you out there in the community. It's a weekly newsletter that sums up the last week, talks about what I'm watching in the uh, the coming week, uh, all the strategies, news, stocks I'm watching, things like that. Uh, I've put a link in the live chat there if you want to uh, click through that and sign up. Again, totally free, just something I like to do uh, for all you out there in the Bowtie Nation. Um, I'll also put that in the uh, in the comments and in the description below if you want to click through there after after the live stream. But let's uh, let's get started here because you know uh, we we wrapped up our five video series last week. Great inspirational story from Brian and Crystal, two uh, two of you out there in the Bowtie Nation. Talked about over five videos. We talked about you know how they're using a side hustle, passive income uh, to to grow their grow their wealth and, and make more money to invest. You know. Brian started out investing just ten dollars a week, uh, he said, and uh, he's been able to grow that since to about three hundred dollars a month uh, investing just because of that side hustle, because of Crystal's passive income Etsy business. Um, so it was really fun sharing those five videos and uh, and different ideas for those things. You know, uh, sharing the ideas for passive income, for uh, side hustles, and how to get started investing. So if you haven't seen those yet, go back in there uh, in the videos section of the channel. Check those out because because it was. Not only some great ideas, some great information, but really an inspirational story for for how they've got started and uh, and how you can you can get started as well. Next week uh, we're getting on our regular schedule Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with some new videos. Got the eleven cheapest stocks in each sector coming for you. I think that's uh, that's Wednesday. Going to drop that video. Uh, really really fun putting that one together. Really the the cheapest stock in each sector of the economy to build that diversified portfolio against different uh, different risks, different drivers, and uh, different sectors. So so make sure you check that out. But here I wanted to get started because uh, you know like I said I've never really shared. Any, any of this uh, this stuff about me on the channel, you know, and as much as I, I love uh, the community feel and the face to face feel that we get here on the channel, uh, it you know felt a little a little hollow because you know I've never really shared that that side of my personality or anything about myself. So I thought I'd uh, take the the end of the year just to kind of share uh, some things about me. And uh, again, I would love to hear more about you in the comments below, in the comments below the video, or when we do our local meetups. First thing, uh, you know, as most of you know, I, I was in the Marine Corps. I was an armorer, so I, I fixed uh, short, you know, uh, uh, single single weapons. You know, so uh, not not your big bazookas and and things like that, but uh, but just mainly uh, machine guns, pistols, uh, rifles, shotguns, M203 grenade launchers. We did a lot of uh, work on those. You know, was in the Marine Corps, didn't get to see the world, as they say, right? I went basically from one recruit depot uh, for my boot camp in San Diego to the other recruit depot to work uh, at Paris Island, uh, South Carolina. I uh, had a great time, though. Loved my MOS school. Basically, if you don't know, uh, when you're in the military, you go to your boot camp first, uh, and then you go to maybe some um, some extra field training, but then you go to your MOS school, right, which is your occupation. Uh, again, I said uh, I was an armor, um, but you'll go to your, your school, which is usually, you know, three to six months or so to learn about that job. 
Uh, loved it. The MOS school for the Marine Corps is at an uh, Army Proving Grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, great, uh, great place. And, and even more, it's so close to DC, to Baltimore, to New York City that uh, we were able to go there uh, uh, quite a bit, you know, on the weekends and stuff. While I was in the Marine Corps, I, I was a bartender two nights a week at a, at a local bar. I loved it. Probably one of the best times of my life. You know, I love that social, that social aspect of bartending, just, you know, getting to know people on the other side of the bar. And probably why I love doing YouTube so much is, you know, building that sense of community and, and really having that. One of the weirdest things about me, and pretty much not even my fan, the rest, my extended family knows about this because uh, I've only been doing it for about a year and a half. Uh, but something that uh, a weekly ritual, I guess, that my wife is thoroughly tired of over the past uh, past year and a half, I think. But every Friday night, you know, I pour myself a glass of Jack Daniels, and it's a uh, Jack Daniels honey, right? Had to had to share that. You know, if Jack Daniels ever wants to sponsor the channel, I'm here. <laughs> Because I'll, uh, I'll pour, my, pour myself a glass of that on the rocks and watch a couple of episodes of The Twilight Zone. And that's the 60s version. Definitely not the uh, the 90s version or, or any of that. Uh, it's got to be the 60s version. It was uh, 156 episodes, uh, five seasons to 1964, right? And uh, just, you know, a lot of different reasons. One is that because I do work Saturdays and Sundays, then... It's just a way for me to reset the week, right? Uh, if I didn't have some some ritual each week where I just reset and uh, you know kind of marked the passing of a week, I think I'd go crazy uh, because the, each week would just bleed into the next and it'd just be one continuous stream of, of work. So it's a really good way to just kind of reset the week, start over. But you know, also I just love the series, right? And if you've never seen the old uh, the old '60s Twilight Zones, uh, get a copy of some of them because uh, they're amazing, really well acted and, and written. Cover all the deepest desires and, that that we all feel, right? You know, for example, the um, one of my favorites, Of Late I Dream of Cliffordville, right? It's a season four episode, so it's a little bit longer. It's about 40 minutes. And it's this guy that has everything. He's, he's you know, a multi, multi-millionaire in, in the 60s. So that would have been, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars now. Uh, he owns everything, and but he's just he's just rootless. He's he's directionless because now he owns everything, and, and you know there's nowhere else to go. There's there's no more drive. Uh, so he wishes he could go back, go back to uh, to the Cliffordville that he grew up in, uh, really doing everything again and and all that. And of course, you know he makes a deal with the devil, which is expertly played by the um, you know the one and only Julie Newmar, the uh, the original Catwoman there. Um, makes a deal with the devil to go back and uh, it all goes wrong, obviously, because it's the Twilight Zone. Uh, but it's just a great episode there. Uh, check that one out. Check all of them out if you if you want. But but yeah, just love uh, kind of relaxing on a Friday night watching two or three episodes of uh, of the, uh, the 60s Twilight Zone. So one of the weird things about me. Uh, I am from Des Moines, Iowa. Moved to uh, Medellin, Colombia in 2006 to do business con- consulting around the free trade agreement. And uh, loved it, you know, Medellin, Colombia. Uh, so we're talking way south, south of the border. Uh, we're high enough up, we're right on the equator, but high enough up in the mountains that it is 80 degrees all year round. So perfect weather. Cost of living is about a fifth of what you would find in the United States. Um, so actually ended up uh, moving back down here, went, went moved back up to the States for a little while to work. Uh, moved back down here with my wife and son in 2013. And we've been living here ever since. Uh, you know, it's it's... And while we're ready to move back, and we'll talk about that, um, it is a great time, great place, or, or a great opportunity to, you know, if you're trying to create an online business or you know freelancing or anything that takes a little bit of time to get some some real traction and start really making some money. You know, a lot of those online business ideas we talk about on the channel, like uh, like YouTube, like blogging, like freelancing, anything like that, they don't they huge opportunity. I mean, you can make tens of thousands a month uh, in in a few years but they don't make uh, money immediately, right? So if you can move to somewhere where your cost of living is gonna be $1,000 a month, which is very much possible here in uh, in Colombia or, or a lot of other places, especially Latin America, Eastern Europe, Asia, I know, um, then it can give you the opportunity to be able to pay the bills, support your family, but still be able to grow that online business while you, uh, you know, when you need to. Uh, we are getting ready to move to Tampa, though. Uh, like I said, uh, we've visited Tampa over the last couple of weeks. Really like it. My wife and I visited. We can't bring the whole family yet, though, because we had actually adopted a three-year-old daughter here in Columbia about two years ago, 
and uh, the US law is, or the visa process is, you have to wait two years after you adopt someone to get a visa, to apply for that visa and that citizenship and that kind of thing. So we're still waiting on the visa for her to come through. When that does, we're gonna move back. And uh, again, love to do some more local stuff, not only there in Florida, but uh, you know, coast to coast, uh, get to meet some of you out there in the, uh, in the Bowtie Nation. Uh, a little bit more, I uh, am married, nine-year-old son, and we adopted our three-year-old daughter. She's five now. Uh, two years ago, I'm a history nerd, okay, uh, you know, in, in every aspect of the word, right? You know, especially human history and, and really kind of how we, uh, how we moved from, from place to place, you know, how we started in uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Fertile Crescent right there, right, Mesopotamia, uh, all the way through there, and how we got everywhere in the world. Uh, and one of the things, one of the things I, I'm really excited about doing right now is kind of beginning to uh, study the history of a family tree, right? Of my family tree, kind of going back and seeing where everybody's come from and uh, why. You know, what was what was the history of the period and and the place where they were back in history? I think it's just think it's a really interesting way to study history is study your history. Right. So if you've got a family tree or, or if you're thinking about putting one together, do that, you know, put put back your family tree uh, or figure out your family tree back through six, 10, 20 generations. Right. Where they were from, uh, the different places, the different history around those places and and the kind of the conditions and history that in which they lived. Um, so really excited about doing that. Last thing before we get to our question and answer. Um, and this is something, uh, you know, something for all you out there in the nation. I'm kind of torn between the business of YouTube, right? Uh, and then just the desire to help everyone invest, help you become better investors and, and really connect with you out there. And what I'm talking about is, you know, on YouTube, you know, and this is something you realize when you start a YouTube channel is that getting views and not just, not just getting more views, but getting your videos shown to other people on YouTube, right? is very much, um, you know, a function of giving people what they think they want, you know, giving people the, the hot, uh, the hot stocks and, and the hot tips and, and investing ideas, the strategies, things like that. But it's not always exactly what's best, right? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do an example. And, and basically, you've seen this a lot of investing channels over the past year, uh, exclusively talk about uh, meme stocks, cryptocurrency, uh, you know, just anything that has been hot. And you look, you watch a lot of these channels and basically it's just, it's chart porn. You know, it's somebody getting on there and saying, oh man, look at this, look at this chart of GameStop or look at this chart of uh, Teladoc or something. Basically looking at how much has gone up and saying that's an investment. Uh, and nothing wrong with Teladoc. I actually own shares myself, but you got to do more than just look at the chart and, uh, you know, and, and as a, as a means or as a rationale to invest. Uh, but that's a lot of what's been really popular on YouTube over this past, uh, over the past year, year and a half is just that chart porn kind of channel. Uh, you know, those hot stocks kind of channel. People have been excited about that and it's made people money. I will admit that a lot of these meme stocks, a lot of the hot growth stocks, things like that have made people money. Uh, and that's why people are tuning into those kinds of channels. So, you know, to really grow a channel and to be popular on YouTube, then uh, then a, a lot of times you feel like that's kind of what you got to do. Um, but that's not, again, that's not exactly uh, what's best for investors. So what I always try to do is come in with, uh, you know, reasons uh, how to invest and why to invest. So you'll see every channel. And I know a lot of people always complain about, hey, just get to the point. Just give me the five stocks that I want to buy right now uh, and make it a two minute video, basically. And I can't do that. I won't do that, you know, because that does nothing for you. I want you to know more, not be dependent on some Yahoo and a bow tie to be able to pick your stocks, right? If, if you're watching the channel for a year, six months or a year, I want you to be able to go, go, into, the, uh, go into your Yahoo Finance or your investing app and, and be able to pick your own stocks and know why you're picking them, not just because the stock price has gone up or anything. Okay, so that's a lot of the reason why... Uh, a lot of my videos are maybe a little bit longer, you know, 20, 15, 20, even 25 minutes long because I'm taking the time to actually show you why you're investing in this stock, how you're investing in the stock and things like that rather than just, hey, invest in ABC because the stock price has gone up over the past six months, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, hope you enjoy the seven things about me. Uh, I'd love to hear more about you in the comments or if you got any questions about me, just go ahead and ask them. Uh, but I want to put it on into the... Uh, the question and answer 
part of the uh, of the live stream. That's my favorite part, obviously, because I get to uh, get to talk back and forth with with you out there in the community. Uh, I'm going to scroll up to see if I find any, if I can find any questions there. But let me know if you've got any questions. Uh, if you do have uh, any questions, make sure you use a question mark so I can uh, quickly and easily see what uh, what you're asking there. Keith, Keith McPherson, thank you for that uh, 99 cent super chat. I appreciate it. Got the hot dog icon there. Um, kind of cool. What uh, what else? Uh, a lot of people just happy holidays. I just forgot. You know, I got so excited about getting started and all that. I uh, forgot to say just happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, excited about 2022. Um because, uh, because you know, I think it's going to be a lot of opportunity, a lot of risk, but but a lot of opportunity as well. Uh, <clears throat> what else here? Uh, Lose Lose Cat says she lo- loves the Twilight Zone. Man, it's nothing better. I got to tell you, I, I love those those older episodes of the Twilight Zone. Again, uh, you know, some of the best written TV you can find. And I don't know, I've I've watched. Um, because, uh, okay, so a lot of it, probably about half of it was written by Rod Serling, the creator there. Uh, he actually did another series back in the late seventies called, uh, night zone or, uh, night gallery, right? Which was very much the, the same idea of twilight zone, uh, but not nearly as good. Oh my goodness. I bought those DVDs. Haven't even watched all of them because they were just horrible. So I, I don't know what happened, you know, with the sixties, uh, twilight zone, him, uh, uh, Beaumont, uh, a lot of the, the collaborators on that. Maybe they sold their soul to the devil themselves uh, for just some amazing episodes. Uh, check them out because because some of them are, like I said, they really deal with the deepest desires, the regrets that we all have. You know, the desire to to go back and do something over again, uh, to immortality and and those those kinds of things. Uh, desire to to uh, you know talk with talk with past uh, you know past friends and past loves, things like that. Uh, that it is uh, really great. Uh, lose lose okay actually uh, we'll move on from twilight zone but i just i love talking about it but it's so fun but an an, an occurrence on owl creek bridge could not get into that one of the 156 episodes i i, I think i probably love 90 percent of them that one it was just too abstract i think for me i actually i, I like the uh, uh, you know uh what's his name uh, alfred hitchcock presents uh, a little bit earlier than that did an owl creek uh, rendition on his show too. I actually like that one a little bit better. But anyway, we'll move on from Twilight Zone. Love to hell. Maybe do a live stream sometime just talking about Twilight Zone because, like I said, that is my weekly ritual. Uh, love doing that. Um, Alf Alf wants to know why did I decide to join the Marines? Uh, basically, I, you know, I mean, I, this goes back through high school and that, and really kind of kind of that drive. And I think this is most people that join the military, in fact, and, and join the Marine Corps is is you feel that uh, that uh, you know that need to uh, that need to service right uh, to to help uh, to help serve serve your country that virtue right in the true Roman sense of uh, you know of protecting your your country your nation and you know your loved ones that kind of thing so it was a real it was a real deep desire or sense of uh, you know to protect and to serve. Um, the Marines, you know, I, I really wanted to be uh, kind of on the ground kind of thing. Um, never really wanted to go up in a plane as far as the Air Force or the uh, or on a boat as far as the Navy. Have some family in the in the Navy and uh, great guys, uh, but kind of just attracted to uh, to to the Marines in that respect. What else? Uh, what else? Just looking for some uh, some questions here. Ah, Lorenzo wants to know better to buy a house or rent, uh, and he's talking Florida 2022 here. But I, I think all across the nation, across the globe, really right now, uh, housing prices are crazy, and this is something we, we're struggling with actually, uh, because we've been we've been watching uh, actually kind of stalking houses on uh, on on Zillow for about a year now since we've decided to move back. And uh, just seeing those prices explode higher, really, it is getting kind of insane. But but rent prices are going up too. So what what I'm thinking is, you know, basically if you compare what you're paying on the interest, uh, taxes, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff that you wouldn't have to pay if you're renting, right? So rent, you just pay the rent and you get house maintenance, you get taxes, you get uh, you don't have to pay interest on, on any loans, that kind of thing. If you add all that up, uh, you know, for if you're buying, compare that with rent. 
I mean, basically it's pretty close to the same, right? So, so if you're renting, you're not getting that house price appreciation, but you're paying pretty close to the same amount that you would pay, uh, you know, in all that stuff for, uh, for a house. Um, so we're probably thinking about, uh, buying, buying, uh, as soon as, as soon as we get there. Uh, obviously it's a personal decision. You have to make your own decision as far as, you know, where you're at, what are the prices versus the rent prices there. I don't see too much wrong with waiting a year to, uh, to see what house prices do either. I don't think house prices are going to go up another 16% a year. So I don't think you're going to lose out quite on, uh, lose too much of, of that, uh, that equity and that principle that you're building with just waiting to see how, how things happen. But, uh, but then again, I don't think you're going to, you're going to make, make a very bad decision if you just buy now either. Um, because, you know, we don't, we're not seeing that, that bubble market in real estate, like we saw back in 2007, 2008, right? Uh, there's still a very, uh, a very high demand for houses and very low inventory of houses for sale. So, it's not something where we're obviously in a housing bubble where prices are going to fall, you know, 20 or 30 percent like they did back in 2007, right? So, you know, while housing prices might come down, what they they might not grow by 16 percent a year, they're not going to crash by you know five, 10, 20 percent either. So, you know, I think it's I think it's really where you're at and what you want to do, uh, that kind of thing. What else do we have? Need recommendations for when? So Iman wants to know, uh, wants needs recommendations for when to cut losses on dividend stocks. Um, for dividend stocks, it's a little bit different. You know, I, I think, I think it's probably uh, more of a factor of when to cut losses on growth stocks and things like that. Dividend stocks, I mean, those are generally uh, more stable and longer term holds. Okay, uh, longer term investments. Uh, all my dividend stocks are companies that, that have very stable cash flows, very much long term, uh, long term investments. So I really don't look to uh, to, to cut those, uh, you know, cut losses on those. Usually, usually they're not losses over the long term. What I will say, and, and we've done a video on when to sell your stocks uh, before. It's usually not to do with the price. It's not to do with how much you have in losses because you know stock prices are pretty much instantly adjust to pretty much all the news and in fact a lot of the expectations for a stock. You know, so um, so for example, uh, AT and T. You know, rumors come out or, or management says they might cut the dividend. Right, uh, that is instantly reflected in the stock price as well as you know what how much people think they might cut the cut the dividend okay um, analysts go through they do go through their cash flow analysis that kind of thing to figure out okay how much is this dividend going to be cut what's that going to affect the stock price and then prices pretty much adjust automatically so if you're cutting if you're if you're selling your stocks uh, to cut losses or because they've uh, they they're they're losing you're really not getting uh, you know you're, you're really not getting out in front of anything um, if anything else, uh, a lot of times you sell your stocks and then they rebound, you know, because they, you know, they come back closer to that fair value. What I do usually do when cutting my stocks is I look at, okay, was there fraud or a scam or something, something in the company and then no responsibility, no accountability by management. That's one of the most important ones, right? Uh, so for example, we see something like the scandal at Wells Fargo a few years ago where, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the company, the, the, the incentives were set up to where uh, employees just wanted to create accounts, you know, and they were doing that. They were creating fake accounts uh, just to get their bonuses and just to meet their numbers, right? And they found out about it. Actually, the, the company found out about it uh, a year or two before the rest of the market did, before the public did, but they really didn't do anything about it. And there was no accountability for it. That's the most important thing is, is when the company found out, as well as when the public found out, there really, it took a long time to have any kind of accountability, like the CEO got fired or resigned. Uh, a lot of the management, uh, you know, resigned or was forced to account for, for you know, that kind of incentive structure. Uh, so that's a, a real, you know, a real warning sign for a stock when something happens like that uh, and nobody says, hey, this is my fault. This is what's happened. Uh, and, and I'm taking responsibility for it, you know, because if, if there's no accountability, if there's nothing done to change to change why that happened, it's going to happen again. Right. And, you know, your your stock is just going to go through these cycles of, uh, you know, of busting and, and crashing stock price because it goes through another one of those scandals. Um, so that's one of the one of the reasons why I'll sell a stock. Another reason why I sell a stock is, you know, if they get on this merger and acquisition uh, binge, right, and this debt fueled binge, uh, which is something that happened to AT and T. 
you know, something, a video we did uh, actually about two years ago, warning investors about AT&T. Everybody loved AT&T shares because they paid that dividend. They had always paid the dividend. Um, but, you know, if you look at it, they were on that acquisition strategy where they were basically just buying up all kinds of business, everything they could, and fueling it with debt. They were taking on uh, tens of billions of dollars in debt to buy these other companies, to buy Dish, to buy uh, all these others. And, um, you know, the writing was on the wall. They weren't going to be able to service this uh, this dividend unless these acquisitions just resulted in massive cash flow. And it was obvious they weren't, right? So it's happened to Teva as well, Teva Pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, over the over the years, Teva's basically their whole business model was just acquiring other companies and using debt, uh, you know, getting loans to fuel those acquisitions, right? So uh, what you have, obviously, in most of those cases, and I'd say, 60, 70% of those cases where a company is doing that, they're loading up on debt just to buy other companies, is uh, those acquisitions never become the cash flow they thought they would. Obviously, eventually that debt becomes a problem. They have to cut the dividend or uh, you know they have to cut capital, capital spending, that kind of thing. Growth slows down. So that's one of the things that I look for uh, for a reason why I, would, I need to sell the stock, okay? Great question though. Uh, what else? Uh, in a service like Harold wants to know what's the internet service like in Colombia and the cost. Uh, basically, we pay our internet with uh, the lights and, and water and everything. I think we pay about a uh, hundred dollars a month. You know, uh, actually, it's a little bit less. It's maybe about eighty dollars a month. Again, that covers internet, TV, so cable. Uh, that covers electricity, lights, gas, pretty much any all that public uh, public utility kind of stuff. Uh, so. You know, comparable for for something that would cost you uh, three, four, five hundred dollars a month, I, I think, in the U.S. And, and understand, a lot of times this is I'm comparing this to maybe Chicago, which is about a city about the comparable size as Medellin. Uh, obviously, in places in Colombia, you can get you know for nothing. You can get it for for much less. But a city this size of, of two or three million people, uh, you're going to pay a little bit more than than you would in the rest of the country. But it's a very dependable internet. It does go down every once in a while, but uh, but it's usually it's usually not a problem. <clears throat> what else? Uh, oh, I saw Best Buy here, and I wanted to. Somebody asked, okay, uh, FF Medic wants to know, would you stay long-term on Best Buy? I'm down 20%. Best Buy has been hit hard. And this is actually something that I put in uh, in the weekly bow tie tonight. So again, sign up for that. It's a totally free weekly newsletter we send out. Uh, some, something I'm watching here over the next few weeks is retail stocks, okay? If you look at a lot of these retail stocks, Best Buy in particular, uh, but Best Buy, The Gap, uh, you know, there's a couple of those other retail names. Target down big over the last three or four weeks, right? And I think a lot of it is that Omicron scare. Uh, people were worried that uh, it's going to keep people locked down and not spending. The thing is, though, if you actually look at the numbers uh, for holiday shopping season, it's supposed to be a very strong holiday shopping season. Everything we've seen from Black Friday through other initial reports, uh, people are spending their money. People are getting out. People aren't really too, too scared about the increase in uh, in COVID cases on a daily basis. Uh, so I think it's going to surprise. I think you're going to get a lot of these retailers, and especially you know Best Buy is is set for that to to benefit from that. Uh, but I think you're going to get a lot of these retailers. Uh, in as we move closer to fourth quarter reporting, which is going to start in February, March, that kind of thing, and they're going to report their sales and earnings over this last three months of the year, um, you're, they're going to be much better than expected. Okay, I think I think a lot of people are going to realize that the holiday shopping season was stronger, uh, stronger than expected, and people got out, they spent that money, and, and I think a lot of these retail stocks are going to do a lot better. So I wouldn't sell uh, Best Buy right now. I know it sucks to be down 20%, but I think uh, I think. The value is definitely there, and uh, the upside upside is there. So, definitely be watching those uh, those retail stocks, the ones that have sold off over the past uh, couple of couple of weeks, especially. <clears throat> is there any stock that you wouldn't buy due to ethical reasons? Okay, so I uh, defense tobacco, simple chess, uh, indeed. Ask that uh, great question. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I should probably be a, a better person in that respect, and and really invest morally and ethically and that kind of thing. I just can't, you know, I'm from an equity analyst background. I look at the numbers. I am very much an analytical type of person. So I don't mix the two. You know, I, I contribute to uh, charitable causes every year. I, I, I do that and I enjoy doing that. Um, 
and helping people and that kind of thing. But I really don't mix my investing with uh, with ethics. Okay, uh, I own shares of Altria, Philip Morris. I don't smoke, but it is a, an amazing cash flow company. I think they they've got some really good investments on the cannabis side as well uh, for that growth. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, I mean. I don't think people should smoke. I don't. I don't smoke myself, but I do invest in the company because it is a very strong dividend. It's a strong cash flow company, and, and it's it's done very well for me, uh, you know, in the past. Uh, so so there aren't probably aren't any any companies that uh, that I probably wouldn't invest in for ethical reasons. Uh, now, obviously, I mean, if there were companies that that were just uh, you know beyond the pale, uh, I don't know that they would be they would be able to uh, to issue shares and be on the market anyway. You know, if if there was like a, a company that was doing euthanasia or something. I, I don't know. I don't know a, a, an example of where where that would be a case. Uh, but generally, like I said, generally, I try to uh, you know try to keep those two separate, my ethical uh, and moral decisions from from what I'm investing in. Uh, <clears throat> what else? <laughs> what else? Uh, Rich says thoughts on Macy's. So ticker M. Uh, you know, I haven't been a big fan of Macy's, and I know I just said that retail stocks should do well into the fourth quarter, and, and Macy's may be a, a part of that. That's that's true. They've actually, have obviously got a great brand name. I just don't like the department stores. I mean, I think you know, department stores have had a bumpy ride over the last year. Some of them have done very well, but if you look at it, they really haven't changed their business plan. You know, so so what is to keep uh, department stores from doing any better? over the next two years versus how they did before the pandemic, you know, before, you know, when, uh, when JC Penney's was getting, going bankrupt, when Sears was bankrupted, when Toys R Us, even uh, Toys R Us and Montgomery Wars were bankrupted. Um, what has really changed for these companies? Very little, you know, so I don't think, I don't think they've changed their business plan or their way of doing business in a way that, uh, that can actually make them long-term sustainable businesses. Uh, so it really kind of worries me. Um, uh, the retail that I am investing in uh, are all uh, companies like Best Buy that have a strong online presence, uh, that have uh, that that are getting more of their money from online, uh, from their online shopping and e-commerce things like that, as well as the companies like uh, you know like maybe Tapestry that sells to maybe a higher end market, you know sell, sells those those luxury goods because we know the luxury side of retail has done better in the rebound, you know, over the last year. <clears throat> Okay, Kwasi wants to know what stocks I'm looking at for 2022. A uh, great question. Uh, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna update our 2022 uh, or launch our 2022 Bowtie Nation portfolio here in January, January 5th, and I'll start talking more about 2022 stocks. Uh, I've been talking, had a few videos uh, about those over the past uh, month, but really. Really, I'm looking at a lot of the same themes. You know, I think we've kind of got a second chance here in this last month or two with the sell-off in cyclical stocks. Okay, and whenever I say cyclical stocks, I mean stocks in uh, you know financials, in energy, in materials, and industrials. Okay, those are the four sectors that really follow the economy, follow economic growth. Okay, and what we've seen over the last couple of months is really a sell-off in those names uh, as interest rates came down because of the Omicron fears. Um, as investors maybe jumped back into some of those growth names, things like that, uh, a lot of those stocks in those names have sold off, and, and some of it, a lot of it, I think, is profit taking as well. You know, energy and financials were two of the uh, the strongest sectors here over the last year. I think financials or energy stocks actually did like forty percent, forty percent on a year over year basis. Um, the uh, the financials weren't too far along uh, uh, behind, maybe about a thirty percent return on the financials. Uh, stocks in the financial sector over the last year. So a lot of it was just uh, profit taking, a lot of institutional funds, a lot of money managers, that kind of thing, selling their selling their positions in those stocks that have done well this year to book to to book that gain. Uh, and then they're going to start, you know, here in this next week and in early January, start uh, positioning for 2022. And I think again, you know, just like just like last year, 2022 is going to be the year of those cyclical stocks, right? Uh, we're going to, you're going to see interest rates rise. So you can see the banks do very well. You're going to see higher inflation, which means energy and materials will, should do well. You're going to see economic growth, which means the industrials uh, and, and all of those sectors should do well also. 
So I think, again, just like we saw last year, I think the cyclicals are going to be a little bit higher returns and not quite the risk. Uh, you could still see growth stocks, so stocks and technology, communication services, so all your internet stocks, uh, those could still do well. But I think they're going to have the, uh, you know, they're going to be kind of limited from, from those rising rates, from maybe a slower, a little bit slower economy and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I would definitely... Uh, Definitely uh, weight, overweight in my portfolio in those cyclical stocks, bank stocks, uh, energy stocks to, a, to an extent, uh, as well as materials and industrials. What else? Uh, do you speak Spanish? I do, although I don't, uh, I don't speak it nearly as well as I used to. Uh, so Electric Pop wants to know. Uh, actually, when we, you know, obviously coming down in 2006, I spoke Spanish nearly fluently uh, to do that business consulting around the free trade agreement. When we moved back in 2013, I was still uh, pretty well conversational, conversationally fluent. Uh, but over the last, I'd say two, three, three years even, I just don't go out enough. You know, I've it's part of it is, is you got a family. I, I got a family of a five-year-old and a, a nine-year-old. Uh, so any free time away from the business is spent with them, usually here at the here in the apartment. Uh, and so I don't go out and practice my Spanish quite as much as I used to or, or as much as I as I need to, kind of in my own English bubble, right? We watch TV in English. I work in English. Uh, so my, my Spanish has, has suffered quite a bit. What else? Uh, ooh, savvy Money Show wants to know what my biggest regret is. And this one's this one's going to be kind of tough, uh, something that something I, I really haven't shared with anybody. Uh, so, uh, you know, and... and so my mom remarried when I was six, right? Uh, married some, someone and uh, never really, you know, or it took a long time to really get close to, to, to I now call my dad, right? Uh, you know, my step, they were married for a little over 10 years, right? Uh, actually divorced while I, while I went off to college. And, uh, you know, it really, and we grew really close after, you know, while I was in the Marine Corps and, and just before, uh, I'd go over, you know, every every weekend on Sunday, we'd watch movies, eat pizza, and just kind of talk, and I really had a great time. And uh, but he died uh, died of cancer when I was when he was 42, when I was about 21. And the big my biggest regret is always that, you know, I really never treated him that well or got that close to him while you know while my parents were married. Um, you know, so it so it feels like we missed out on so much time that father son relationship that we could have had that we really only had maybe those last few years uh, while he was alive. Uh, of course, you know he died way too young, so so that that's really you know he, he didn't deserve that. Uh, he had a tough life. He's overweight uh, for for all of his life, so he was really distrusting for, of people. So I think. You know, my biggest regret was that I didn't really get close to him sooner uh, and, and that he died so young. He, he really, really deserved a, a better life than that, than, you know, to, to move into a family where the son really didn't bond with him quite as much as he should. But, uh, you know, that's that's really kind of the biggest regret. And I think a regret that a lot of people have. So, you know, if your parents are still around, hey, you know, hug them, go, go tell them you love them and, and, you know, talk to them and that kind of thing, because going to be a time when they're not they're not around and uh, I guarantee you if you if you haven't you know built that bond and and shared shared yourself with them then then that is going to be something you you do regret for the rest of your life uh what else uh Ivan 100 ruble super chat I appreciate that thank you uh can we hear about your thoughts on the Santa rally uh actually did the uh did the Santa rally live stream last week um so typically over the last four days Four trading days of the year and the first two trading days of uh, the following year, that's what's called the Santa Rally, right? And over 79% of the years, uh, so three, you know, three out of four of the years since like 1928, those that period has been positive. And it's been positive an average of one point, uh, I think we, we the research said about 1.9%, 2.3%, something like that. It's not a huge jump, right? It's not something that's going to make you rich, but it is a nice pop to the end of the year. And it is fairly predictable, right? Three out of four years, uh, you know, in that period. Uh, this year, I think we get it. You know, I think uh, the market is kind of entering a stage where uh, it's kind of a relief rally. Okay, so through you know through December, November, we had a sell-off, some profit taking, but some of it was also adjusting to that idea of interest rate hikes in 2022. Uh, a lot of the year was spent worrying about inflation, worrying that the Fed might take away that stimulus faster than than we would want. Uh, and, and I think in November and December, we finally came as investors, as the market 
came to that realization that it's going to happen. You know, inflation is at multi-decade highs, six uh, percent and higher. It's probably going to stay there for a lot longer than the Fed realized. Uh, the Fed started changing its uh, its its uh, its outlook and and what it said publicly about that. Uh, so I think there, late November, early early December, and through December is uh, you know as that as we saw that sell off that was driven by investors coming to the realization that we are getting more interest rate hikes in 2022, uh, and I think that's pretty much baked into in into prices right now. Right, the uh, the market is pricing in three interest rate hikes in next year. Uh, it's pricing in a faster taper of the uh, the bond of uh, the Fed's bond buying program. Um, so that's really off the uh, you know off the table. Okay, uh, that's that's one thing the market doesn't have to worry about. I actually think the the upside is to the opposite side that maybe if Omicron is a little bit worse than expected, or if uh, inflation actually does come down a little bit, then uh, then I think the market can start saying, well, hey, maybe we don't get three interest rate hikes. Maybe we only get two because you know the Fed is extremely dovish. It's extremely accommodative. Uh, Chair Powell. A lot of the people on the Fed, they would like to keep interest rates lower uh, for longer. And uh, and I think, you know, some positive, just a little bit of positive news on either, uh, you know, either the COVID situation or uh, or inflation will give them the excuse to start saying, you know what, maybe we won't raise quite so quickly. And that's going to be a positive for the market, right? So you've got that. You've got obviously the, the Omicron is just exploding higher. If you haven't seen the current daily cases, they are they are booming higher. But nobody seems to wor matter or worry about it, right? Uh, people are still getting out. They're still shopping. Like I said, all data is pointing to a very strong holiday shopping season. Uh, the states aren't talking about lockdowns like they did quite as much, uh, you know, in the Delta and other uh, other past surges. So, you know, uh, I think people are coming to the realization that hey, you got to get vaccinated. You got to get a booster. Uh, it's just a way of life now. I mean, uh, COVID was something we've been talking about over the past many months is COVID is going to become endemic. It's going to become like the flu. Every couple of years, you got to get another vaccine vaccine for it uh, to help help keep you safe. People are realizing that. So that kind of worry is, again, coming off the table, just like the others. So what I'm saying is that, you know, over these last, uh, this, this next week, even the next couple of weeks, I think you really see that relief rally as, uh, the the market stops worrying about these things, starts looking to uh, you know still low interest rates, still very strong uh, household balance sheets. You know households are still sitting on trillions of dollars in excess savings that they can now go out and spend things like that. Uh, and I think you get, you get that relief rally ex, at least over the next couple of weeks, and especially you know as we head into fourth quarter earnings, uh, you know as as some of the news of this uh, holiday sh shopping uh, comes out and, and kind of boosts some of those stocks. What else here we got? Uh, what about Stitch Fix? Uh, Stitch Fix from Tanvir. Stitch Fix was one of, one of the big uh, one of the big uh, the wins of the year, and then one of the biggest disappointments, right? I think uh, back in late 2020, so back back last last year, uh, recommended Ch Stitch Fix. Great social platform, social e-commerce platform, really doing something that a lot of the other e-commerce uh, companies weren't, uh, doing a lot of great things with AI and that kind of thing. Uh, so I recommended the shares. It was around $20, $22 uh, per share. Shot up to like $96 a share this year during 2021 uh, and has since come down to about 2020, uh, about that same recommendation price, right around $20, $22. Uh, so you know, a lot of you out there in the nation, I know you booked those gains, made some amazing returns there on Stitch Fix. For those of you that didn't uh, that didn't book those returns, I think you can stick with the stock. I think I like it again at this price. Obviously, it's back to that twenty dollars a share price uh, around there. And I think uh, you know, I, I think it does surprise. I, I think it's not only a strong stock for this fourth quarter holiday shopping season. Uh, but I think it's a good long-term play as well. You know, for a lot of the same reasons that we talked about in that initial uh, recommendation video, uh, it's doing a lot what a lot of these other companies need to do. Okay, it's doing a lot in that AI e-commerce kind of field that I think is really going to drive the long-term valuation for this company. Okay, and I still I would not be surprised at all if it eventually does get acquired by some of these other retail companies because it is so far so much further along in e-commerce. And in uh, in that AI driven e-commerce that uh, that every every retailer every company is going to need here in the next ten years. So definitely uh, definitely Stitch Fix there. Uh, okay, 
So, uh, so Ivan wants to know where were you learning Russian or what made you do that? Uh, and actually don't know where you, where you heard that I was doing that, but I was, I did try to learn Russian for about a year. Uh, I've just always, I, I mean, first I, I, I always really been fascinated with obviously Russian growing up in the eighties. It was, you know, Russia versus the U S right. And, and I always want, I always had that curiosity, right. More than just what the propaganda was telling us in the U S or, you know, what the Russian propaganda was telling, uh, Russians there. I always wanted to learn, you know, learn more about Russians. So I always, uh, uh, appealed the the language has always appealed to me as a very strong you know very strong sounding language right loved the uh the the old national anthem was very a very strong uh you know strong national anthem so uh, so i started learning russian actually had plans to move to uh to visit moscow back in 2005 bef- actually before i came to columbia i uh, had plans to visit there and those didn't those actually didn't uh, didn't come to come come out but uh you know, was was learning mostly by tape and and by reading, uh, trying to read myself. I actually took a a short course at the uh, the university at Iowa State University on learning Russia, but it's so hard. That Cyrillic alphabet is so so much harder than than the Romance languages like like uh, you know like Spanish and that kind of thing. So gave up on it. Uh, I don't don't remember much more than Zdrasvutye uh, and uh, and Hershel. Right now, uh, so maybe maybe one day learn a little bit more. I'd love to love to visit, uh, you know, Moscow, Saint per- P- Saint Petersburg, uh, some of those other other places, Vlad- Vladivostok, that that kind of thing. Uh, but would love to visit sometime. So so maybe I'll pick it up again someday. What else do we have here? Put that in a stream. Okay. Yep. I can no longer read Russian though. So all of these, I, I mean, I, at one to- at one point, I had a pretty good control of the pronunciation of the Cyrillic alphabet, but uh, yeah, now it's, it's, it's tough uh, trying to remember what the, uh, the symbols uh, actually stand for. Yeah, Alex Mo wants me to say something in, in Russia. It's, uh, that's it. Здравствуйте, хорошо, and obviously, I mean the big ones, до свидания, things like that. Uh, that's about it for anymore. Yet, yeah. Uh, what else? It's good. To, it's good to learn some Chinese so you can communicate that. Uh, not necessarily with the Chinese massage girls. Come on, man. I think my wife watches these live streams. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've always always wondered about Chinese as well. Uh, again, though, the the different alphabet. Uh, it's always it's always tough. But but you know, it's 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 too bad. Uh, one of the one of the jokes that that I've always loved is what do you call someone that speaks three languages? Well, trilingual, right? What do you call someone that speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone that only speaks one language? American. And it's it's the tragic truth, right? Uh, you know, we Americans, we speak English and that's it uh, for the most part. And it is too bad because there are so many other people out there that uh, that we could communicate with and talk to. And you really don't know somebody until you know their language. Uh, so that's one thing I've always tried always tried doing in my life is learning other languages just enough at least to, to be able to carry on a basic conversation with, with people. Uh, Okay, so Ivan says that you know, when we when we when we visit, then then he'll organize it. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, what else? <clears throat> Chinese stocks. Mystery Publishing wants to know about Chinese stocks. Yeah, did a did a video uh, a couple of weeks ago on the delisting fears uh, of Chinese stocks, and uh, I mean there's two sides two sides to that. If you're if you're investing in Chinese stocks, I think right now probably Alibaba is the only stock that I would I would uh, get into. It's a great company, strong valuation, but right now it's just the the Chinese government interference just worries me too much. There is too much of a of a binary uh, return on that. And binary, I either mean you make really good money or you make nothing. You lose everything. Uh, and it's because, yeah, the Chinese government is just cracking down on there. And a lot of it, I think, is what people don't see yet. You know, I think uh, the Chinese government is looking towards 2022 as a, a, a kind of an inflection year in their economy. Property prices are still very much falling. Um, and it's going to be uh, it, it could be a very tough year for the Chinese economy. They've already started cutting rates and trying to prop up the property sector. But, uh, you know, property is about 30 percent of the wealth in China. It's very much more than uh, than the stock market, like like in the U.S., like in other other countries. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of these developers are just crashing. Right. So uh, and, and it's going to get worse. You know, property developers in China have something like I want to say four to six uh, billion dollars 
of, uh, of bonds maturing and that they have to roll over in January alone. Uh, it's something like 14 or 15 billion during the first three months of the year. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of defaults. And in fact, uh, I was reading something on the Bloomberg uh, the other day that Chinese developers, they typically pay you know, upwards of half their pay to their workers as one kind of bonus lump sum kind of thing in January before the Chinese New Year. Uh, so that's coming new. And that's, that's, you know, upwards of, I think I saw like a trillion dollars that they owe these workers uh, before, you know, January, I think it's January 20th, 21st, something like that. Uh, so that is a huge outlay that they're going to have to buy, they're going to have to pay for. They're not going to have money to pay the, pay off these bonds. You're going to see a lot more Chinese developers default, uh, go bankrupt in January, in February. Um, the the property sector is just going to get hit harder, and that's why the Chinese government, I think, is now and over the past few months is is stepping in and trying to control the economy even more. Right? Uh, you get financial crisis, you get an economic crisis. People uh, people start moving their money offshore. They start uh, moving into other currencies, right? So that's why you you see the uh, the Chinese government crack, crack down on cryptocurrency, uh, money flows, or things like that, so that they can keep a control of that currency. Because otherwise, your currency just just gets destroyed, right? Gets ruined as people move their money, uh, you know, outside of your outside of the country. So what we've been seeing with the Chinese uh, government, these controls over the companies, controls over mo money flows, it is in anticipation of what's going to happen in 2022. So that really worries me. And it's why I think that even as these stocks have come down so much, have fallen, I think Alibaba is down like 60% uh, from its peak, all time lows, things like that, still a great company. Even against all that, I still don't think uh, it's the right time to get back into Chinese stocks just yet because I think there's the next shoe to drop definitely in these. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Stephen, thank you for that $5. I appreciate that $5 super chat. Uh, can you explain call options? Uh, it's, that's a big question. Uh, that's something actually we did a video uh, about five or six months of, on my five favorite option strategies. Definitely check that out. If you go to go to the channel, go to the videos tab and then search for options, options investing. You'll find that video. It's about a 56 minute video. So it really goes in depth on options, different option strategies. Call options are basically, uh, you know, a it's a contract. It's an investment that you make that gives you the right to buy another stock at a certain price over a period of time, right? So, for example, uh, and let's let's do a quick, uh, you know, just a quick explainer of this. Uh, I can show you here if I set this up for you. Okay, so I can I can go to pretty much any any large stock, uh, and we'll look at. Okay, we'll look at Robinhood just because it's one of the ones in my in my history there. So Robinhood's had a pretty tough year, but if I think uh, Robinhood shares are going to rebound, uh, and uh, and I want to leverage my bet, okay. So one one thing you can do with options is really leverage, uh, you know, leverage that return, right? Because you're going to be paying much less than the per share price uh, for that right to buy the shares. So if the shares do go up, you make more money. Uh, another way to use options, and what I'll talk about is is really the way to uh, to hedge your risk. There are great risk protection uh, on stocks, but if I if I go in here to Robinhood, and so I say I think you know I think their fourth quarter announcement, uh, so their fourth quarter earnings report is going to be really strong, uh, and I don't know exactly when they're going to uh, when they're going to announce that, but I would say it's probably going to be here in uh, you know February or March. So if I go to the May 2022 options, now what, what this is, is any of these options, these call options, is going to give me the right to buy shares of Robinhood uh, for a certain price anytime from now to May 20th of 2022. Okay, options always expire on the third Friday of the month. Okay, that's options expiration date. Third Friday of every month, those, uh, those options expire. And you can see I can pick options from all kinds of different months. Those, the, the monthly ones, sometimes you've got weekly options, uh, even ones that are further out, January 2023, January 2024. But let's just say, you know, I want to I wanna get a leveraged bet on, on shares of Robinhood. Uh, it's trading at about $19 right now. So I can go in here and these, this strike price, this strike price, this blue column right here, this is the price that I want to lock in on shares of Robinhood. Okay, any of these options, I can I can buy, I can pay for these options and lock in that price. Okay, so if I wanted to lock in a price of eighteen dollars uh, for shares of Robinhood anytime from now to May twentieth, 
then I would pay what's called uh, the the premium, okay? And here it just says last price or you got the bid desk spread here. We'll just use the, the last price here. Now this is the premium. This is what you pay for this investment, for this option, uh, for this right, okay? So here, I uh, see the last, uh, you know, this this options contract, this call contract, four shares of Robinhood, last traded at $4.90. If I pay that $4.90, I lock in the right to buy shares of Robinhood for this price, for the strike price, $18, anytime uh, before that option expires. Now, why would I do that? Because why would I pay? So basically, I'm saying, I'll, I'll pay you, I'll pay another investor $4.90 now to buy it at $18. Well, that means my cost, my actual cost of the shares is $22.90. Why would I do that if I could just go to the market and buy a single share for $18.90 right now? Why would I pay $3 or uh, $3 extra? Okay. Uh, and it's because it's because I lock in that, pr that price for just $4.90, right? So if I think uh, Robinhood's going to come out here in their fourth quarter earnings announcement and say, man, we blew the doors off profits. Uh, we really made a lot of money. If I think that share price is going to go to twenty-five or thirty dollars, then I can lock. I just I locked in that eighteen-dollar share price, right? So if shares of Robinhood do go to let's say thirty dollars, uh, you know, on that announcement, or, or you know, even before that, if they go to thirty dollars, then I've locked in eighteen. I've made twelve dollars uh, profit. Basically, those that option contract. The premium for this, what I paid the 490, that's going to go up or down along with the shares, right? Uh, and it's not going to go up or down exactly with the shares, but it does go up and down uh, as the shares go up and down as well. So if that, you know, if that uh, call option for for Robinhood, if or if Robinhood shares go up to thirty dollars, that premium on the call option is probably going to go up to, you know, uh, so it's a it's about eleven dollar difference from now. It's probably going to go up to at least you know, at least $10 each, right? So basically, if we're looking at, so if it goes up to 30 from 1890, that's a 58% return. That's a pretty good return just on the shares. But if those call options go up to $10 each and I paid 490 for it, that's double, you know, that's double my money. That's 104% uh, in, or 104% return in that limited amount of time in, in just the next four months, three or four months. So, so that's really kind of the power of call options is you can lock in a price for a stock, you leverage your bet, I'm only paying $5 for something that could go to, to 10 or 20 or $30, or whatever. Uh, so you're leveraging your bet, you can make a lot more. So that's kind of the basics of call options. Um, again, watch that earlier video because they go way beyond that. In fact, my the way I use options, it lowers your risk. Okay, so you can sell sell call options against some of your stocks. Kind of lock in, uh, you know, collect some instant cash for the stocks that you own, and and kind of lower your risk. So so definitely check that out because it's a it's a great way to use options and, and call options specifically. What else do we have here? <clears throat> Dean, Dean, thanks for that ten dollar uh, super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, any cybersecurity or data center REITs that you've noticed to be undervalued at the end of this year? I feel both do well researching come uh, this coming week. Uh, you know, specifically REITs, I, I haven't. I haven't looked at uh, cybersecurity or data center REITs lately. Um, and in fact, I mean, cybersecurity tends to be the the companies themselves, right? I mean, most of the cybersecurity stocks like Zscaler, uh, like Palo Alto Networks, that kind of thing. It's not necessarily the REITs, uh, because you know, I mean, what the the REITs, the 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 technical or the the internet driven REITs are are the data center REITs, right? They they own the infrastructure, the uh, the the servers, the network servers, things like that, and the data centers themselves. Uh, not necessarily the the cybersecurity programs and, and that kind of thing. So not aware of any uh, specifically cybersecurity REITs. Uh, that would be interesting uh, to see any of those. Um, but data center REITs, uh, they've done really well uh, over the past year. So I think valuations might be kind of high, like you said, uh, looking for undervalued ones. Uh, but you know that's one of the ones that there's obviously very much a, a very bright future for those. Uh, one thing I can show you if you're looking at REITs, uh, one thing you want to check out, you can go here to, uh, we'll go to Google and search for it. Uh, it might make it a little bit easier to find. So if you search for uh, REIT performance, we'll go in, in, in a R E I T performance and try searching for that. 
And the, okay, so again, this is Nareet Performance, N-A-R-E-I-T. So it's it's basically taking you to the National Association of REITs, uh, that's REIT.com, and it's taking you to this historical REIT returns uh, section, right? So so the NAREIT, the National Association of REITs, publishes the REITs by property sector, or returns by property sector. sector. And you can get this in Excel or, or PDF. We'll just get, download the PDF real quick so I can show you what I'm talking about. So if you're looking at REIT stocks, you always want to think about it in terms of property sectors, okay? Real estate is not just one big, uh, you know, real estate sector. Uh, you really got to think about it in terms of what are the property types that are doing well and, and are going to do well. Where have they gone uh, in the past year or so? And... Uh, you know how do you uh, how do you look at those? So so you go here again. You just search for the NAREIT. That's REIT.com. Performance by property sector. It's going to take you to this page that they update. I think every month. Uh, that's going to show you past returns uh, on these. So if you look at some of these, you know, uh, so REITs in general have done really well. 29% return year to date, which is one of the highest one of the highest returning sectors so far this year. Uh, but again, if you look here at individual uh, individual property sec segments, uh, you really start to see which has done well, which hasn't done well, maybe where some of the opportunities are. Uh, obviously, industrial. Industrial, one of our favorite uh, REIT sectors, STAG Industrial, ticker STAG, one of my favorite uh, stocks as, as well as REIT stocks, done very well over the last year as that e-commerce uh, idea builds and, and really you know increases the demand for warehouse space. Uh, obviously, office space has gotten crushed. Uh, it's still done 13% this year, but obviously underperformed the uh, that 29% overall return and and underperformed the rest of the market. I'm actually thinking that that office property could do better here over the next year or so as we start to uh, start to deal with the 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 COVID situation a little bit better. Uh, as someone that's worked from home, uh, you know, for more than eight years now, I can tell you there will always be need for office space. Uh, I rent I rent a co-working space uh, regularly. Uh, I love to get back into the office. Things like that. Uh, and, and I think you know a lot of uh, I think a lot of these office REITs are. Uh, down into valuation territory. Uh, more to your point, those these data centers, those are only up 20% uh, so far this year. So it is underperforming the rest of the REIT uh, sector. Um, I think maybe there's an opportunity there. I would want to look at, like you said, look at the valuations because these these data center REITs did very very well uh, over the past two years. You know, obviously with that pandemic lockdown, a lot more demand for uh, for data traffic and. and and the data centers did, did well, so I would be looking at valuations in those, but but none, none really really come to mind offhand because it's been a been, been a little but been a little while since I've looked at them. Uh, in our REIT video that we did do did do a REIT video about a month ago on REIT stocks for 2022, so take take a look at that. Look for that on the channel. I did point out that self storage is one of the uh, one of the property sectors that I think I'm avoiding for 2022. You can see here uh, self-storage, the self-storage property market has done 57%, almost 58% return just this year. And it actually had a very good 2020 as well. Uh, not sh quite sure why people are, are renting more self-storage spaces, uh, but there was actually a write-up in the Wall Street Journal just this last week about uh, you know just kind of a boom time for self-storage. And of course, that's always that's always a warning sign, right? When uh, when it, something when a trend becomes publicly known, when everybody starts seeing it and that kind of thing, it's it's generally kind of the top of it, right? The top of the uh, the top of the peak on that. So I would be worried about self-storage uh, property sector. You know, anytime uh, anytime a property sector uh, sector of real estate goes up 58% in one year, you got to start worrying about a bubble. You got to start worrying about uh, about valuations and that kind of thing. But some of these others, uh, some of these others look good. You know, like I said, office I think could be a, a rebound and could be a, a surprise. I think a lot of these lodging and resort uh, REITs have sold off here in the past few weeks as the Omicron started building, and I think there's some opportunity there, as well as healthcare, the healthcare facilities REITs. Um, you know, you saw for for these hospitals and servicers to serve and really triage all of those COVID cases, they had to pull back on some of the higher profit margin uh, uh, stuff that they could, services they could provide. So that's uh, that's 
fed into that seven eight percent return on healthcare REITs over the past uh, the past year. So I think there's some rebound potential there, as well as just really great dividends. You know, uh, the dividends have kept up have have kept up in that sector. So you're getting a four percent plus dividend on those hospital stocks, those healthcare service stocks, uh, as well as the potential for uh, you know for some rebound in those. What else do we have here? Uh, Michael, Michael wants to know, uh, what ETFs would you suggest to grow the most over the next 10 to 20 years? Is there an aggressive uh, EV ETF or an aggressive solar clean energy ETF? Uh, great question. A couple of questions in there uh, as far as ETFs to grow the most over the next 10 to 20 years. So with ETFs, obviously, you know, if you're looking at growth, you're very much looking at uh, the, the growth themes, okay? And you pointed out two very good ones there, the electric vehicles, solar, clean energy, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I would say uh, solar and clean energy has sold off here uh, recently and, and over the last six months as some of the money has come out of those growth names, those growth stocks. I would point out the uh, the QCLN, uh, ticker QCLN is, is pretty much the largest uh, clean energy fund ETF. I think that's probably the best way to, to get an ETF in that theme. Uh, and obviously, yeah, I, I think over the next 10 or 20 years, clean energy is, is only going to get a bigger part, become a bigger part of our uh, of our lives. Uh, so I think that one's probably a good opportunity. Uh, and we can actually I can actually look in here to uh, to Yahoo and show you which one that is. Uh, I don't rem quite remember the fund provider that uses that. It's First Trust. That's the First Trust NASDAQ Clean Energy Green Energy Index Fund. Uh, so it's quite a mouthful there, but it's ticker QCLN. Uh, the yield kind of sucks, but you're going to get that with growth stocks. Uh, the expense ratio 0.6% is a little high, but pretty typical for these kinds of you know theme uh, theme investments, theme ETFs. Uh, so that's going to be the one you, you follow on that. Now, as far as the electric vehicles, we did an electric vehicles uh uh, video just this last week had some great names in it for copper uh, as well as the charging stations because I think with the electric vehicles, you know, the, the car makers are played out. Yeah, the car makers are where everybody's investing for that electric vehicles theme. Uh, and so the valuations are very high. Even even those traditional legacy automakers like Ford, like GM, the shares have been bid up uh, on those hopes. Uh, so I don't think there's quite right now there's quite as much value left in those traditional automakers. So we were talking about maybe maybe going further into the idea into charging stations, even into copper. Um, the IEA, the International Energy Administration, uh, I believe is is predicting or forecasting a shortage of uh, of copper, right? A, sh a supply deficit in copper uh, because. You know, you need three times as much copper in electric vehicles as you do those those traditional, uh, you know, those legacy combustion engine vehicles, right? So we're going to see a huge demand spike in the use of copper over the next five or ten years as the electric vehicles become the norm. Um, so we were talking about copper stocks. Now, one theme or one ETF in that, and, and I think, you know, this the copper plays that we talk about and this this fund. So this fund is the. Global X Copper Miners ETF, that's ticker COPX, it's probably not something that's going to make you rich. You know, it's not going to be like Tesla and, and quadruple over a year or anything, but it's going to be a strong price return along with the yield, right? You get a 1.3% yield here. Dividend yield is not high, but but it is something that is a cash return, and you're going to get a fairly strong price return on it uh, on that theme as well. Uh, so not going to make you rich, but but it's going to, uh, it's going to do its job, and, and I think it's going to outperform what people expect. Uh, otherwise, I know the CARS, the First Trust NASDAQ Global Auto Index, that's uh, ticker CARS or CARZ, excuse me, uh, NASDAQ Global Auto Index Fund, CARZ. That's another one that's going to give you that exposure to uh, electric vehicles, although it is more obviously diversified across the entire auto, auto industry, uh, that kind of thing. So just a couple that, that you might look at for that. Uh, for that theme, in that theme of electric vehicles, solar, clean energy. Um, you know, as far as growth, uh, it's again, it could still. I know a lot of those names have come down. If you just look at the Arc Innovation Fund, the ARKK, it's come down something like uh, 23, 25 percent uh, over the past uh, over this year. 
and uh, and I'm not quite sure that it's it's quite into the value territory yet because you know you could still see some sell off in 2022, but a lot of the a lot of the names in that uh, and, and that fund in particular is probably a good way to get kind of a broader exposure to the stocks that that will change our lives over the next 20 to 10 to 20 years. Okay, so so I think I, I think you can do well with the fund. Uh, I generally prefer to to pick for a lot of these growth growth names and and individual names uh, i like to go with the individual stocks right uh for for my for the big part of my portfolio 50 60 percent of my portfolio i will invest in etfs but it's very much a broad market return kind of idea i want market returns on stocks bonds and real estate and maybe some alternative investments with those etfs okay for that that growth part of my portfolio i want to pick the individual stocks that i think will do will do well over that over that period what else do we have here what about Wells Fargo? Political Economy 101 wants to know about Wells Fargo. I like Wells Fargo. We've had it in the uh, we had it in the 2021 Bowtie Nation portfolio. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's it's a very it's, it's a strong bank stock. Again, I think bank stocks will do well in 2022, and a lot of times that's how I like to start my investments. Uh, my investments is that with that broader idea. You know, I'll start with okay, what sectors are going to do the best this year? And we know, you know, with uh, with inflation and with interest rates going up, we know bank stocks do well. Okay, so then I want to drill down into the bank stocks, and I think Wells Fargo has some surprise potential left in it. Okay, uh, I think uh, you know as it gets closer to moving beyond these Fed mandates, right? Because after the scandal, after the fraud, uh, the Fed came in and said, okay, you know what? Uh, we can't trust you, Wells Fargo. We're going to put some mandates. We're going to put some rules and restrictions on your stock and on your company. And, um, you know, it's not able to raise cash payments. It's not able to raise the dividend because of that. It's not able to grow its asset cap, uh, you know, very, very much higher. And so they have a lot of these restrictions that they're going to be lifting uh, here, I think, in 2022. I think the Fed will come in and finally say, OK, you know what? Uh, you've proven that that you've gotten back on track and you can handle yourself and, and we're going to lift these restrictions on you. And I think that's when you really start to see Wells Fargo take off. You start to see you're going to see they raise their dividend. You're going to see they start lending more and raising that asset base uh, and that kind of thing. And, and that's really the surprise potential in Wells Fargo beyond what you get with, you know, some of these other bank stocks, right? Bank stocks could still do very well. Uh, and I think you start, you see them do well here in 2022 with the rising interest rate environment. But, uh, but I think Wells Fargo just has that little extra surprise potential. Uh, Ivan wants to know where we see a futures video in 2022. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on it. You know, I mean, futures is, is always kind of a tough one to do because, because I actually, I want to make one around a specific uh, or, or around an example, right? And I don't do a whole lot of futures trading anymore. Uh, so I actually have to wait for, you know, when I actually do one, uh, a futures trade to be able to use that as an example. So I've been planning on, you know, if, if uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum can get up to my, my target price, then I might do like a, a cover or a cash and carry strategy with that using, you know, selling the futures to lock in, uh, you know, a price on my, on my Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, Maybe I might do something on the dollar or, or maybe oil prices. If oil prices really drop uh, quite a bit again down into the lower 60s, then I maybe I'll buy some uh, oil futures and, and show something on that. But but I re yeah, I'd really love to do a, a futures one, but I, I really have to do it you know when I can find an example to, to really demonstrate in my own in my own account. <clears throat> Thoughts on solo. Uh, so Michael wants to know about solo and. Honestly, I really haven't looked at that. So Electric Electra Americana Vehicles Corporation. Really honestly couldn't tell you a whole lot about this stock. Uh, I mean, I do appreciate the super chat obviously, but uh but so this Electra America uh, Electra Mechanica Vehicles Corporation. It's a $286 million uh company, so a penny stock company uh but but it's got I mean it's got some good volume it's got a good market cap so it's a, so it's not the kind of company that is going to be subject to a pump and dump scheme right there is just too much volume too much market cap there for for the smaller uh, boiler rooms to really to really move that so I wouldn't be worried too much uh, about that uh, but uh, but you know if you if you look in here I mean and this is really what I look for just as a, a real quick analysis. When I look at a stock, I mean, you know, if I don't know much about it, then I'll come in here to profile and, and you, you look in here. So this is a, a Canadian company. Uh, so so good, uh, you know, good, good jurisdiction as far as uh, investor rights, that kind of thing. 
development stage company to manufacture sells electric vehicles in Canada. Uh, so it's so it's in that electric vehicle theme. So the first thing I'm thinking, if I'm looking at a company in the electrical ve- electric vehicle theme, I'm worried about valuation, right? A lot of these companies have gotten very expensive uh, over the past year, so I want to make sure it's not too expensive. So I'm going to go here to statistics, and I'm going to look at a price to sales. Uh, yeah, that's tough, man. 341 times sales. Uh, now, I mean, I can look here in the financials and see how, how it's grown sales growth. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, a stock, a company that has grown sales from 86, uh, 86,000, just 86,000 in sales in 2017. Uh, had a really good year that year. 2018 grew it to 570,000, uh, but hasn't quite done quite as much in the past few years. It grew it to 816,000 here in the trailing 12 months. Uh, so, you know, the uh, if we look at a maybe a three year annualized rate. Uh, so if we do that, so let's look at 816 divided by 570. So 43% over the last three years and an annualized growth rate of 12%. That doesn't I mean, that kind of worries me. OK, so so. Uh, any kind of growth stock, any of the stock that I'm really paying a high valuation metric for, so a high PE, high price to sales ratio, anything like that, I want it to be growing those sales, growing those earnings just by at least 25, 30% a year to be able to to rationalize that valuation. So just looking at this, I mean, 12% growth, annual growth, it really worries me that uh, you know it's just going to take so much so much time for this company to grow into that valuation. Now, obviously, there's more that more to go into this. Uh, so I would want to look at okay, how are they growing their operating profits? How are they handling their their cost of the increase in cost of revenue, that kind of thing. And what you'll see here, I mean, just looking at operating income, uh, even though their sales have pretty well jumped from 2020 to 20 to the tra- trailing 12 months, the last year their operating profit has fallen, you know, so they've actually lost more money on an operating basis, lost $27 million in 2020. Over the last 12 months, they've lost $52 million. Uh, so obviously, I mean, you know, obviously growth stocks, new stocks, startups, companies, they, they tend to, uh, you know, hit these periods where they are losing more on an operating basis because they're spending more, they're, they're ramping up production, that kind of thing. But just looking at the numbers, I mean, these numbers kind of, kind of worry me, especially for a stock that's trading for 340 times on a price to sales basis. Uh, so, so yeah, I would, you know, I would worry about that. Uh, and, and it's something that, that I would have to be confident that, you know, they are, they are growing into, uh, better numbers in the, in the future. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, safest countries to look at in the next downturn. Okay. So NK wants to know safest, safest countries to look at in the next downturn, as far as not sure, uh, what you're, uh, what you're talking about for safest stocks, safest countries. Uh, I think emerging markets are, are kind of a worry, a worry, a worry for me right now as far as stocks. So if you're investing in stocks of emerging markets, it's, uh, it's, it could be a tough year just because, you know, as, as the dollar increases and what we're seeing right now is the dollar, the value of the dollar is increasing versus other countries versus other currencies, uh, because of that interest rate outlook on the federal reserve. So the dollar is increasing. And what happens is a lot of those emerging countries, those emerging markets, they've got so much dollar denominated debt that it gets very hard to service that, uh, they, they have a, a bigger problem with inflation typically on those. So, you know, emerging markets could have a tough year in 2022. They, you know, they, they were the darlings of 2021 for a time. And then they kind of fell off that pedestal, uh, here in the last couple of months here in the last three months as well. Uh, so I would worry about emerging markets. Um, a lot of people are talking about Europe as far as valuation and, uh, you know, and what it could be doing. Uh, I think, I would, you know, I'm not quite in that camp just yet. Uh, uh, so I would worry about that. Uh, as far as Asia, I haven't heard quite as many people talking about Asia. I, I know India, the Indian stock market is doing very well, and that could continue to do well. Uh, Asia has obviously got a little bit more growth than some of the other developed markets. So I think, you know, as far as safety, I, I could start looking at uh, the Asian markets. So, so maybe Korea, maybe maybe even India, China. Again, you've got those problems. So I think that that gets hit. Australia, I think probably uh, countries outside the U.S. I think I would look at Canada and I would look at Australia as far as uh, probably good uh, good countries 
uh, to withstand some kind of a some kind of a market sell off. What else do we have here? Rates affect big cap, small caps. How does this cycle work? <clears throat> how do REITs? How are REITs affected on big caps, small caps? Not quite sure what your question is there, as far as you know how REITs affect on big caps, small caps. So what's the correlation between REIT stocks and other stocks, the big, the, the large caps, small caps, or, or how, what's the, uh, I don't, don't understand that. How does the cycle work between them? Well, with REITs, obviously it's, it's real estate. So it's obviously very much more yield sensitive uh, and it's very much uh, an inflation play. So as you've, I think, as we've seen this year with the, the with real estate stocks and with the sector, I think you've seen uh, REITs do very well because of that inflation play. Uh, so obviously, uh, it is an inflation hedge as a as a real asset. Now again, that's different for the property owning REITs apart from the mortgage REITs. Mortgage REITs are very much different because they don't own the property; they own the mortgages behind property. Uh, so those are very much different. But but I think you know as you start seeing. Uh, Inflation become a long term problem and a long term issue. I think you know REITs will continue to do well uh, as far as interest rates. Obviously, higher interest rates are a a, a limitation or a, a headwind for REITs for real estate. But you know, I, I think uh, even despite inflation being pretty strong, I think I think central banks and the Fed especially can keep a cap on interest rates. I don't think they'll raise too much or too fast. Uh, just because how much debt is owed. You know, if you look at the government debt, uh, the U.S., developed countries, Europe, all that, if you, the, 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 uh, so the federal debt, if you look at debt held by corporations, uh, all of that, it's really, you know, it's really going to be hard to raise interest rates too much because, uh, you know, because it's going to be hard to service all that debt. So I think central banks around the world are going to do everything they can to keep those interest rates low. Uh, obviously, you know, there is very much a, a lot of cash uh, held uh, across the globe uh, by by pension funds, by uh, a lot of these other uh, institutional funds. So I think they're looking for uh, places to invest. That's going to go into treasuries and things and help keep those interest rates low. You know, even as the Fed starts uh, investing in, in fewer bonds. So I think you know, I think uh, to your point, I think REITs continue to do well because inflation is still higher, but uh, but interest rates don't don't go up too far too fast. <clears throat> Okay, uh, OBNK, small bank thoughts. Uh, Steven wants to know about OBNK. Not really sure OBNK. Not really sure which one that is. Uh, Origin Bank Core. Uh, <clears throat> so if we go here, Origin Bank Core, it's a small, small regional bank, I, I'd guess, uh, under a billion dollar market cap. Uh, let's see where they service here. Uh, so that is there in Louisiana. Uh, so a regional bank there in Louisiana, uh, retail clients, Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi. Uh, looks, I mean, obviously, it's going to be a commercial bank. So, uh, you know, I like I like a lot of the commercial banks. As I said, uh, re, you know, Origin Bancor, I would want to look at the first thing you want to do when you're looking at bank stocks is you look at this price to book ratio. OK, because because banks hold their assets on their balance sheet, uh, you know, they hold all their their loans, all that kind of thing as assets then uh, you want to measure it on this price to book value, the book value of their assets, right? You can't use, you don't want to use really the price to earnings or the price to sales quite as much. Uh, you go straight here to this price to book. And 1.4 is a little expensive. Uh, usually I like to see a banks under, you know, under 1.0 as far as price to book value. That's going to be your value territory. Obviously you would want to look at where this stock has traded in the past on that price to book value. Some stock, some banks just, you know, over their history, they trade for higher price to book because, you know, they're more profitable, they're more efficient, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe they pay, pay a higher yield. So this might not be quite as high as, as it looks uh, if you look at the history of this price to book value, but this is this is generally on the high side for banks. 1.4 times is, uh, is pretty rare as far as uh, bank valuations. Uh, what you'll see in a lot of other banks, um, you know, Wells Fargo, I think, uh, even trades usually trades for a premium. I think that's uh, up about 1.2 right now. Uh, some of the other regional banks trade for a little bit less. Uh, I like New York Community Bank. That's uh, one of the bank stocks that I own. As, uh, as I said, I own uh, Wells Fargo as well. I own Citigroup. Uh, Regions is another one that, uh, you know, uh, one, one of the regional banks that I own. Uh, so Regions Financial Corporation, that's ticker RF. Uh, and we'll see, let's see what that one's trading for. Uh, you know, so that one's trading for a price to book of 1.25. So 
still over that 1.0 uh, price to book value, but but a little bit lower. Uh, so so yeah, you know, I mean, you want to look at valuation for those bank stocks. You want to look at the dividend yield, and if the uh, you know if the company has been able to keep up with that dividend yield. Uh, Look at the return on assets. Obviously, that's a a very important one for bank stocks. You know because they they book uh, their you know their their financial assets on the balance sheet there. So here for uh, Origin Bank Court, we're looking at the return on assets is only one point three four percent. So that's fairly low. I would want to compare that with other banks just to see you know if they're more or less profitable. And, and my my hunch, my intuition here is is that is quite a bit less profitable than uh, than some of the other banks bank stocks out there. So you know uh, not quite not quite sold on this uh, on this from those two points from evaluation as far as a return on assets uh, standpoint. <clears throat> what else? Uh, Political Economy 101 wants to know how many rate hikes next year. That's the question, right? And and like I said, like we talked about in earlier in the uh, live stream, uh, the market is pricing in three rate hikes for the year. Uh, I think, you know, even whether we get three or not, I, I think there comes a point in the first quarter, maybe even the second quarter, where we start uh, questioning that. Investors start saying, hey, maybe we don't get three rate hikes. Maybe we only get two. And so I think that's going to be a tailwind. That's going to be a positive surprise for the market. Uh, as far as total rate hikes next year, you know, two or three. Uh, I don't think we get more than three. I don't think we get less than two. Uh, so, so like I said, I think that is that is a positive for the market that that we can look forward to. Uh, maybe at some point the market uh, questioning whether we get a full three rate hikes uh, in the in the coming year. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this up. We've been here uh, for about an hour and a half now, a little bit more, about an hour forty five minutes. Thank you again. Thank you for everyone that was uh, that was able to join us this week. I'm trying to do these uh, every other uh, every Sunday or every other Sunday, uh, but love seeing you here. And uh, th again, thanks for joining me.